Latvia, Warsaw. And the very important thing to know is that before the war, before everything horrible started, uh, Poland was a multinational, multicultural, uh, multi-language country for centuries. So it's a very long history of 1,000 years of Jewish life in Poland. And uh, Jewish life in Warsaw was very, also very rich and, and had a very long tradition. And actually we are in the place that was, before the war, very important for the Jewish life. And uh, this was a Jewish area of, of Warsaw. Church. And this church was within the ghetto borders during the war. So we're standing inside the ghetto right now. We are we are standing inside the ghetto now, and I will show you. So the ghetto was established in uh, uh, 1940, and actually, if you see this picture right here, mm -hmm. so we are. This is the this is the picture taken from the outside of the ghetto where, where our car is parked. This is the okay. street we took. Over there is the square we are staying at. So this is this is this wall was. At the end of this street, mm -hmm. blocking this area. So this was the ghetto, and this church was in the ghetto. That's All Saints. This church. was in the ghetto. This, this was in the ghetto. The sentences about the war in Poland. So the war in Poland started in 1939 when Germans invaded Poland. It's the original ghetto wall that was here, that was put here. This is Cupcake. He's talking, he's talking. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So this was put here in 1940 and this was like one of the first borders of the ghetto. This is the oldest temple in Warsaw. Here. Oh. Active every Friday, holidays and bar mitzvahs. This is the original height of the wall. Here's how big it really was. 300 names of people went on the train. Uh, where, where? Old Jewish community would come. Of course, it wasn't paved like this; it was dirt. And they would have all those little, little places where they would sell. Um, they would sell uh, chickens, and they would sell fruit and vegetables. And my family well, where, where would you sell live? all around, all where, around. Where did you live, though? What? Where did you live? That, that's the church, right? So where did you live? No, place? not this church. It's a different church. Yeah, church? The church was a white church with a white steeple, and it oh, had. Okay. Um, Maybe they changed it. It's it. it possible. That it was like a uh, that's where my family and my grandfather had a store right there. That's now uh, where, the, where the dark, um, the entrance is. That door that's dark. You see that? It's a gate that opens up inside, and inside is a courtyard. And that's where they used to live. Oh, that's true. Where I'm standing is where your where your grandparents. You see, Jew. There used to be bigger houses here. They must have demolished them. But this house, this house, looks like more during the Russian period. But that's where we all lived in this apartment. So this is where they made ammunition.
If they meet people who deny that it ever happened, I am a witness. Hitler hoped to kill all children because he didn't, he didn't want them to grow up and be witnesses. Out of my town, out of 5,000 children, five survived. I am the youngest. No, you need a car. Okay. Yes, so, so to tell you that at the very beginning, this part of Auschwitz camp was established for Polish political prisoners. And they arrived here usually by truck cars. But also on this area, they built unloading railway, which was located on the old so, so right now we will let them know that we are entering. They always took over They took a uh, First World War uh, army camp and they put us into it. So here, these buildings were not built for this purpose. They just used as much as was existing to make it easier for them. Yeah. The cheap necessary construction right. was... And they but in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, there was nothing there they had to build. Yeah, Birkenau lot. was built by prisoners. By, by prisoners, right. And right now in this building we have our archives. Okay. It's available to It was supposed to be Kinders yeah. Line transport. Yeah. So just Kinders yes, Line. Yes. But in your that. transport there were just only few children. Right. That's why and they I thought the... that probably all people are able to work. And I was the youngest. People into groups, men and, and women. I remember that. Do you need their papers? Whose paper is that? They are documents from after liberation. Oh, after liberation. Yes. Mm. Oh, Red Cross? Oh, Michael. He, oh, no, this is not my father. In the hospital of International Red Cross. Oh. i tutaj jest skąd, że z Polski no, z Polen, yes. kiedy przyszło do obozu, więc to jest błędna data. Okay. Tak jak powiedział dziecko, to tak wpisywali i wyzwoleń, na dziewczynę. Przepraszam, kiedy było aresztowane, no, no. przepraszam. When you were arrested, what means that you probably Ta. were placed in this camp. In over I was there. arrested. And here when you arrived, oh my God, see the records are the camp? What diseases you i had diseases, not when I arrived, but here. I had, I had scarlet they were, fever. They were, they were placed by doctors who taking care of you in hospitals after liberation. Oh, that's after that's liberation. He, yes. They had records of my showing that my number to the Russians. They knew when I arrived to Auschwitz, it was in July, um, and, and they knew that I was very sick with typhus, which I knew I was sick, I thought it was diphtheria, but in their record it said typhus. So I was really, I was really surprised that they had the records and the records of my mother, her name and her number. It was a very, very weird feeling. Yeah. Several hours. Several hours, we stood here like this, outside. Why four in a row, four, here. Yeah, Why? Yeah, yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Come here, come here kids, do the up end with me. Standing just like that, stand here in front. But there were men and women separately. No, no, you have to, you have to go to the back. I want to go because you got to be. I want to kiss it here. Four in a row. Where do I go? In the back. If you have to be five, five in the back, five rows. What are we doing? That's how they stood counting us. That's exactly just like that. We in a straight line or?
the whole yeah, why, people, why the whole all, like each barrack had their own people. Yeah. And they were afraid that you'd throw them, so run away so they can't be Why are you all going for several hours? First hours, all, hours. People were counted at least twice a day in the morning and in the evening, and numbers should be the same. My worst experience at roll call was when I was standing with my mother for many, many hours and I was beginning to uh, fidget as a five and a half year old child would and a woman SS person uh, dragged me out of, of the roll call, out of the group and began hitting me. And she began really hitting me so hard on my cheeks and her, her, uh, my cheeks got all swollen until her hand hurt. Right. What means after escape something was wrong, when women died in the camp, if something was die. wrong. That's why people were kept standing until prison was found or until this court was found. The longest roll call in Auschwitz was, it was 19 hours. <gasps> Can you imagine this, that you have to stay here without possibility to move? Put water possibility to use toilet? I moved. I went, like this. I went like this. Because I went like this, so a woman SS yeah. came, took me out, yeah. and started to What was amazed that in Auschwitz they have reams and reams of paper and a gigantic room full of the names who were killed uh, in Auschwitz. And my father's name was Grossman, and I saw that they had kept all these records. This is this is this is my father's uh, brother, Grossman Schumann. This is what Sarah. This is his family. Well, it can't be all of them, but Rosa, Rusia, Grossman Rosia. See yeah. all these people. Oh my goodness! Oh, look at that. You see that? And I saw my mother's family name, Pinkusheves. And I saw the same thing, my father's family name. Her name was Pinkusheves and there were pages and pages of Pikushevitz. Somebody, Kalman. Okay. I know Kalman, I, I know, because the name was in the family, it was a Kalman name, Dvorina. She lived, she lived in, in, uh, in Lodge. Dvora comes from Lodge. Is that, oh my God. Okay. of them in one building and usually they slept on three level wooden beds. Here or there? Here but also in our there. own building. Okay. Uh, block number 11 is kept original way but also in the ba basement of this block we have Auschwitz jail. People were punished, executed. All her life she had terrible headaches. She was beaten because she stole a piece of bread to give me a birthday present on my sixth birthday. I was six years old in Auschwitz. So she stole a potato. She was working some potato field. She took the potato, she exchanged it for bread. I got a piece of bread and she was beaten so hard that in 1940, that she was 45 years old in America, she died on the couch for the terrible night. It was very cold, it was winter. So my mother said she's so cold that she needs a coat. So we went to a, a place where they had these fabulous furs. You know, they had furs. They didn't have time yet to send them to Germany. So my mother said like this to me, you see, I can take a fur. It'll be very warm for me. But then I'm benefiting by somebody who was murdered. I'm going to take a man's coat. 
So she went to the men's section, but they had all these men's clothing. She took a coat that was very long, and she wore it to make it shorter so that everybody will know that she's using it because she's cold, not because she benefited by somebody. I remember that. She says, I can take any of this. She says, I can take jewelry. I can take everything. I'm not taking anything, she said. I'm walking out like this. Otherwise, and I learned a lot from her. After the liberation, the only thing we thought about was food. We've been so hungry for such a long time that when the Russians began to bake food, like to bake bread and make these gigantic, gigantic meals for all of us, uh, my mother took me around to show me what happens to a person if they overeat when they haven't had when they hardly ate for five years. They had these gigantic ovens, and I used to go online and get a bread. I gave it to my mother. Then I came back again. I thought we only allowed one. You know, I didn't know. I came back again, and I said, I want more. And by the time my mother said, you bought me three breads. I said, yes, but we, we need it. We need it. And she says, no, we will make more bread. We'll eat it, and we'll get more. This is OK. And you know, she said to me, she took me like this. People were sitting right here against the walls, there. And she said to me, she was dying of dysentery. Because after five years, she couldn't eat. They made these yeah. gigantic soups. They made fat soups with pigs. Um, uh, uh, it's back for the army. So she said, the first day, she said, I'm going to give you, you're only going to eat what I give you. Dry. And many of the people were very sick. Some of them were dying from dysentery, and she, she was very careful what she gave me. She gave me the first day dry bread, one piece of bread. The second day, she gave me bread and butter, and the third day, she gave me bread, butter, and sugar. How was the women more than the men, about time wise? Because very special camp for women. You will be able to see this place. Um, My women, women were very weak. The train arrived right across from this. See those, the... Uh, those tower things? Tower, yeah. Maybe by the second tower, maybe not the first. I know it was across from the tower. And here were the Germans with their with their dogs. You know, with their with their gigantic dogs. When we first got off the train, or the cattle car I would say, they took us somewhere and the first thing they did they undressed us because they were looking for people who weren't well to be um, guests immediately, not even to go into the camp. So that was the first thing. They addressed us, they checked us over. The second thing I remember was they took us to a room and they shaved our hair, our heads. I had braids and uh, I remember it very distinctly the shaving process of my hair. We were undressed. We got undressed right here. Some people got undressed in different, there were different houses if you go in. But for whatever reason, this transport was right here. And then they came to check us. Those that made it, there was a somewhere here was a gate to get into the camps. I don't remember the gates. We entered one of those barrels in the beginning. Uh, one of those camps. And those who made it, those who had all kinds of boils, went in this direction. Somewhere there, there is the there is the crematorium. So. I was standing with my mother. She was on this 
hindsight, I was here, and the dogs were right here in front, and I was back, and all these people were all in front. And says was walking right here. They all here. And this was mud. Or nothing. There was no grass or anything. All this was mud. They shaved, this is all before we entered. Shaved my head and my mother's, and then we entered one of those buildings in the beginning we entered. Later on, they transported us to a different buildings. So I'm not sure whether it was here or a little further on. I only know it was right across because I watched, I watched the SS with the machine guns right there. They were facing us as we entered. And there were thousands of people from here to there, to the to the to the uh, electrified wiring. Thought people walking and running and shooting, and I just stood very still. I remember standing still. And she said to me, "Don't move. Take the suitcase. Hold it." So I stood right here. I held the suitcase in my hand, and she ran in this direction. The train was to the back of me because people were coming out of the train. And the train was full of dead people inside. Some of the women died from sickness, from, from horror, from hysteria. So whoever, so they also came to clean out the, the, the dead people. But I stood right there, just like this. And, she just, and then she came back and she said, this is what happened to your father. He's going to Dachau. He was tattooed already. Somewhere there, there was a tattoo station. He was, he's covered with boils from top to bottom and his best friend was strangled because, because they had, they had uh, in his, in, in his uh, uh, cattle car, they broke out. Uh, people were crazy, the men were crazy. The men were much more violent. Women, we just stood still like this. There they had such fighting that his best friend was strangled and many other people died. With us, people just died from fright from no water, from everything else. So she said to me, you have the suitcase. I said, oh yes, you saw those suitcases. In a very short time they came and they took us all out of here and we started marching. Now, where is the entrance to this? See, I don't remember the entrance. We went straight this way. And we got our first day in Auschwitz. As far as I know, I was the only child. I didn't know any other children. So this was, this was the entry here with my mother. Here they had to build. There they took a whole camp. Oh, you know, remember? Here they took prisoners. So it was always all wood? Even always, all the destroyed ones? Always was wood here. This is why they burned it. And as they were running oh, away. Oh, so they burned it? Yeah, they burned it. I had been two and a half days in a cattle car with screaming women, with crying, with people who defecated where they stood because although there was a pail somewhere, I was told by my mother nobody could even find it, at least I couldn't. Many of them had all kinds of diseases. And I stood for two and a half days next to my mother. So upon my arrival, the door opened. I, I was just delighted to have sunshine and to see the sky and, and to be able to just breathe regular air. When we went down, uh, I was too young to understand what they were saying. The Germans came with their dogs, but my mother said to me, take off your clothes. I was very obedient. Whatever she said, I knew, I knew would be the right thing because she's been, she's been saving my life all along. 
So I undressed, but I spoke to her and I said, why are we getting undressed? All the women were naked. I, I looked to left, I looked to right, and they were all, they were in pairs, two and two. I stood with my mother and they, and I said, why are we getting undressed? They said, they're checking for weapons. And I remember weapons, we're naked. And she, I remember her words, even a bobby pin here is a weapon. That's what she said to me. But then she said, they really are checking to make sure that we're healthy. Because if we're not, she pointed to the crematorium. I knew what she meant, that we will be killed. We will be murdered if we're unhealthy. So I remember turning around and saying, look at me, how, how am I, how, am I okay? She says, yes, you're fine, you're fine. And I said, what about you? She said, oh, I will be, I, I, I'm okay. And she sort of hit her, her uh, cheeks with her hands to make them look healthy and, and red. And that's how we stood until we were given an order to get dressed and to continue to the next place with a shave my hair. On both sides were, were the, 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 the bunk beds, right? The triple decker. In the middle was a, was a brick oven. For what? Uh, for, for warming sometimes. People were there for years. And you could sit on the brick oven, you could walk on it, and it, sometimes I remember it being slightly warm, right? There was a brick so oven. They took us to a room and they shaved our hair, our heads. I had braids and uh, I remember very distinctly the shaving process of my hair. She said, she cut my hair and she said, you poor child, I've got to cut, well, I don't know what language she spoke. And then she just shaved it. And on the floor, there were full, full hair. And, I, and they took my clothes. You're right here, could you hold it? They took my clothes and I couldn't find my mother. There were all these women, only women. We only had women here with me. And um, I couldn't recognize anybody. And then she found me. She found me because every woman looked alike. I was terrified, you know, with my mother. And then she found me. And I don't know what I was wearing, some kind of stuff they gave me. And from here, they took me inside the camp. From here, someplace. How, how do you? Wow, I don't it's so hard. Yeah, right here. You have to imagine this place full of people. There were people here. There were more. After a while, I was with my mother, and when they took me away, they took me to, as I said, to the gypsy camp. And the first thing upon entering there, they tattooed me. The woman who tattooed me must have been no long, no, not much older than 18. She was a Jewish girl. And she started calling that all the children lined up. And when my turn came, she asked me my name, I told her. She said, no, let me give you your new name. And she began to tattoo me. And I was, I was really very fascinated by the process. And I was looking at it. And she said to me, I will give you a very small number, very neat number. So if you ever survive, you can wear a, a long sleeve shirt and you won't be embarrassed. And it's the first time when I realized I may even survive. In fact, I, I think her hand was shaking as she was dipping the needle in, in, in the um, ink. And then she, when she was finished, she told me the number and she told me to memorize it. I didn't know any numbers, I was five and a half. But I, she said to me, 
This is the only uh, name I will answer to from now on, and I have to know it. And then she gave me a rag, and she said, put it in the water. There was a barrel of water. And I dipped it in, and she told me to, to, to press it very tightly to my arm. It shouldn't swell. So I remember the process extremely well because she was a very nice person. Her voice was very gentle as she was doing it, and I've always remembered her. My mother's hair, without hair. Yeah. No and hair. And we were walking down. My goodness. It's such, it was so... It's, it's like a nightmare. I remember looking for her, looking for her, looking for her. But you were from the ship in the sea pool. Because I was shaking in a big room. There were a lot of people. Yeah, I was, I was five and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. should Demolishing, by demolishing Polish houses and villages, they possess bricks, and those bricks were used to build Birkenau camp, 30 brick and barracks, and all of them survived on the oldest part. But because Germans didn't have sufficient amount of bricks, they decided that all other barracks will be wooden, originally designed as stable for horses in Germans' army. Area of Birkenau is almost 178 hectares. More than 360 wooden barracks were built. Unfortunately, till today only 20 of them survived. On the part where you are kept, we don't have barracks, but we still have empty place where your barracks. So that's why that. we will go over. Thank you. Right now. The chimneys represent the remaining of heating system. Of heating system. When yeah. we will be in this place, I will explain. Those people are entering exactly the same room. Oh, all the oh, oh, yeah. Are there any hidden artifacts uh, that you have green or of course. things that are Of course, we have, we have some of them in our archives. We are not showing them to visitors. Uh, but of course, that yes, and especially you can imagine what was uh, in luggage for the victims. They were allowed to pack 25 kilos for their future life. What is the most And I found gloves in a little girl's coat. Look so at this. Yeah, this. From this place, children. Probably you can't Here, you see. I remember coming out. Where was the outside? We were outside. Here. Right here. Well, who was here, this? Here. Uh, it was usually here. They were also people, but we don't know. Children with my. Uh, experiments done. At the end of the camp, in two last barracks. There. And on another part behind the fence. Because when we went outside, we saw children, other children from somewhere, and they were telling us about it. That's how I learned about a, a, a camp. So this was my bath. You know where I slept? What were the experiments? Oh, experiments? You heard one twin of the White other one. First of all, the other
I was in a barrack that housed gypsies um, until they were all uh, murdered. About 40,000 gypsies in a few nights, few days, and then they brought the children there. It was called Sigeinelage, the gypsy camp. So, where did you sleep? I changed twice. For, I don't know why. You walked in here, there was a door, you walked in. Uh, no, I didn't think we'd find our barrack, but I was amazed that uh, the woman who took us uh, to show us, she found my barrack because apparently it was listed in the literature that she had because they kept such records. So she found my name and she found my barrack. And of course, there's nothing there just um, like a, almost looks, looks like a grave. And she showed me even where I slept. So my mother came to get me when she said, come out. First, one time I slept at the top, on the, on the end there, another time on this side, in the middle, on the middle bar, middle bar. Why would they give you heating? Uh, I don't know. Why would they possibly just hide you? Ask them crazy. Absolutely crazy. Crazy, crazy. So they were but true according to needs. If they had more people, more of them were loaded into one. The ball they had, right. Ah, uh, let me tell you, I remember something. They were first. These people went to the guest chambers. Because I walked out and I went this way and I walked in and I said, it's empty. But I remember like left or right or straight. I remember going out here. But I think that you will also remember a little bit more when we'll enter a sauna building. Where you know, they bring up memories that I, I it's way back. I remember now walking somewhere. I didn't know where I was walking. I was walking here. Wow. You know what? I remember walking with my mother, walking, 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 but I didn't know where I was walking. So I was walking here. Oh, yes. As a child, you don't know where you're walking. Oh my goodness. But this is only vision. Uh, they don't have my tower? No. No. Just one map. This is town of the zone. Kids. You have to continue, right? Do you want to see all the little kids? And they were there. It's a wonderful time. Look at those people. You see, look. Old people, look at that. Look at these children. See that? Look, look at this. Everybody gone. They probably were killed immediately.
school, look. Complete school. This is how they took school pictures. For the kids. Look at all these kids. Nobody left. I'm not here. Right? Tell your story. And you'll tell my story. Go to school. Took the kids shouldn't forget, okay? And you tell the story. It's supposed to show you the different way of burying people in different types of cultures. Of course, you can work with your own imagination, but try to imagine symbolic graves, chimney of crematorium, execution wall. But also, you can go part of this memorial of 23 boards. This is the same inscription in 23 languages, main languages spoken by victims. And I think that you would like to see this one. So, let's go over. Minutes, all of them were met. Zonder commando started to work. Drug corpses outside, checked for jewelry. Golden teeth extracted. Long women's hair was cut off. Corpses were transported to the ground level and buried in that one part. But can you see over their stairs? Three of them. Here, yeah. in the middle, oh, in yeah. front of us, yeah. Dr. Josef Mengele had a special room for his autopsy, it's exactly over there, why? Do you remember that I told you that the last stage of experiment it was autopsy? Autopsy, yes. Also in Queens. And in 1944, Josef Mengele looked for people who can work for the units, and he was able to find Dr. Nishli. He was very well known before the war pathomorphologist, Jew deported from Hungary, and Dr. Nishli was able to survive. And right after the war, he wrote a book. The title of this book is I Was Dr. Mengele's Assistant. This is exactly about room over there. I'm telling you also because of something quite different. Do you know that a couple of months ago in Los Angeles was going to have Oscars? What happened? Oscars in Los Angeles Oscars. this year. Yes, of course, the Oscars. Winner, among winners this year is movie titled Son of Soul. Yes, I saw. This movie is about 48 hours of one of prisoners from Zonder Commander. Yes. And one of the parts of this movie, this is exactly the movie. So, which one do you think I was? Two? I don't remember which one. But I remember with the steps there. Before. Do you want to walk around? Yeah, no. I, 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 I think. I think. Uh, I think voice, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I think you've, um, you've, you've seen. You've, I told you the story that we, when I went down, but it was like going down. Yeah. Over there. there. Let's go over there. Yeah, I remember go. going down the step. Last time we were here, we went down the steps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, this is an Israeli group of people. Yes. We walked down the steps, we walked in there. And then there was a room. Yes, there was a room. We got undressed. Exactly. Yeah. No, we waited. We still waited for them. told us to go back, to get dressed, to Three go back. four hours, wow. I think it take a very long time. A very long time, maybe more. In a child, I was, I wanted to do, I was so cold and so hungry, and I wanted to the door to open already, so it was a finish whatever we were doing. And they told but us, you know, that this was well, we kn they no, said it was a shower, know. but we knew nobody was back. And, 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 and the block, 
because of the uh, rubble. The rubble yeah. Fell down. yeah, it felt like it was a very big, big wall. Gas tubers over there. Oh, sorry, not gas tubers. Unless I where, where was it? Where, yeah. where was the room? Here. Yeah, okay, this is it. That's it over there. No, no, no. Here was the entrance yeah. to gas chamber. Okay. Over there. Here was the gas chamber. So we there. were, all these people were here. That's what it was. That's what it was. So many, so many people that were with our friend, not the other children, so my parents. And then you remember what? That you are. You are what Hitler could not kill. Really, you are the best gift that I could have, you and my other grandchildren, because I wasn't supposed to be here, your mom wasn't supposed to be here, nobody was supposed to be here. We were all supposed to be only in pictures. I didn't even know there were any pictures of me as a child. I just disappeared. It's because of you, and, and you have a responsibility. You really do. Okay? Why you keep on Continue Judaism. And tell the story. Continue Judaism. Because if not, sure, Hitler was going to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all bits of ashes. I How do you like that? Laboratory of Dr. Mangula. It's completely empty right now. Oh. Sometimes they should be called pseudo-medical because also his experiments, is, it was that he looked for children with very special disease called heteroteromia iridis. What means the two different color of eyes? Trying to change them, of course, into blue. Kind of chemical solvent was injected directly to children's eyes. And, and without any kind of... Uh, without any pain relievers. Really, nothing. Um, doesn't that hurt like crazy? Yeah. Wouldn't that blind them? Yeah. If you are interested about faith of children, um, one of Polish political prisoners at the time, nine years old, Mr. Bartnikowski, lived here also with children. I want to show you. I had a middle bunk like that. Uh, that and we were sleeping like this. This one. And my mother would show me how to sit when you get up, you know, so you don't get hurt. So she showed me how to roll. She said, if they move, you have to move. And so forth. We had something here, I don't know what it was, either a blanket or something made out of straw. And that's how and we were not allowed to put your feet out. It was a rule. My mother once put her feet out and a woman walked over and smacked her a couple. Why? And said, That's the rule. So you can just all were in there. Now, my only thing is, it was with my mother. When I was with the children, it was different. It was much wider. With the children wider. And they had the, the heating in the center. I don't remember the one with my mother. I don't remember the one with my mother. I don't the children. But with my mother, it was that, that, that size. This is this, this how big it was. The children was much smaller. Yeah, it was small, I said. Well, once the was designed for around 700 people. 700 people. Okay. Because it used to be 60 subbricken spaces built, and on each level of subbed, usually four, seven, ten. It depends how many people they had. And there was no bathroom. It was one bathroom where the altar block, the altus. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but some we have not raised for business, but in, uh, uh, in this club they didn't have Oh, they didn't have it here? Okay. Because we had one, and that's where...
Yeah. Can you imagine? You can tell them how dirty you are here. You never washed. You so in the two of you, you didn't have toilet paper. You didn't know what you had. You wash your hands, and you were so afraid to touch anything. Uh, I was happy to find anything from the floor and eat it. If it was edible, no showers, no anything. That's how you live. You know, so that my feeling of dirt is different from your feeling of dirt. That's true. At the time, it was hot, humid, stinky. Winter time, pretty cold. Very, yeah. Sometimes they had a lot to have such ovens, but no Yeah. By a small, right? I was holding on, and I saw that there were rats all over the dish. And I was up to here. And my mother was trying to get me up, but I had no hair. I did, she didn't know how to put me up. People helped out. And then somebody um, somebody uh, used a hose and hosed me down. That's one time. The other time I told you she gave me a piece of bread to eat for my birthday, my sixth birthday. I hid it. It was in a bed. I hid it here. And in the middle of the night, the rats came and ate everything up. So rats were very, they were that size. Yeah. Everywhere. And of course, they ate. Bread, but usually they had access into human bodies. Yes, and this is why I'm lucky that not even a scratch. This is a miracle, not even a scratch. My, there was no more clothes left. My old bread was gone, it didn't touch me. And when I fell in, it also didn't touch me. Somebody helped me out, out of it. So rats were everywhere. This is original. Yeah, the tree. Yeah. Were there more in these cases? Water pipes with horses. Oh. Water. And there was and some heating. Where's the heating? Oh, no, no, no. The heating, here. heating system was only in barracks where prisoners had to sleep. So we will enter one of them. Oh, you know what it is? In, in the ah, now I know. That you don't have this, we system. left our barracks to come to the bathroom here. So we were, people didn't sleep here. Let's see how I fell in there. You can see, right? This is kind of concrete container covered with a concrete blanket. And it was, all, we all went together at the same time. Look how deep it is. You go all the way under? Yeah, on your, on your butt? That's how far is it down? Pretty what? far. And, no, no, and I fell in, I was sitting next to my mother. All the way in? All the way in, to the, to the ground I fell. What's that little hole over there? No, but I was frightened to death. I was frightened. How did they, they picked me up. Did you get to wash after they, that? Well, they, yes. they, somebody uh, came I with that. I can tell you something. Can you see this part? A hole. This way they were able to help you. Can you see this large hole? Yeah. And this part, every day prisoners from Shai's commando had to open this oh. and empty it. You clean it using their hands and buckets. It was their duty. So that way, if somebody was inside, so yeah. could be oh. safe. So yeah, I, don't remember, I don't remember some, how they could have it. One of the things that was very difficult for a child of my age, five and a half, was not to go to the bathroom any time I needed to and I had to go with the adults. So we went, I think, once a day, all of us, and we marched out, rain or shine, into the latrine. And then there were these slabs of wood with gigantic cut-out holes. Come here to this. I want spider to bite you. are a big boy. You have a so you're big, but I couldn't. Better not to sit on this, because this is original. You oh, can oh, oh, okay. okay. Right, you. Okay, thank you. Wow. Really big ones. And I remember sitting on one of them and I was holding on because they were about three times the size of, of my tushy. And I was holding on, but one time I slipped and I fell inside. And I remember my, my half of my body was in feces and, and there were rats and all the women who were there started to scream and they helped my mother pick me up. I had no hair and she didn't even know how she could uh, pick me out of, out of that mud. And uh, then she got a hose and she hosed me down. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
taken inside Shape. with those bumps. So you can see those large bumps in the house. Yes, we are so the bumps here. are not here anymore? No. We are keeping, we have some, we are, but we are keeping them in Auschwitz. How many people in a bunk? On this, uh, from place on to such place. Large, seven on up this. to eleven. Wait, in one but bunk on or? Some, this, on one okay. level. Ari, yeah. can you right on this. Yeah. I would stay in Napoli. Never move. Ari, come on. It's done. Why was it? Is it because in one hard? big bag. And I, no, never hard. Who are you talking about? But I would stay in the house. Can you stay there? Yes. Yes. Why? Yes. How would you stay there? Yes. How would you stay there? How would you stay there? How would you stay there? We make faces. And for years, one of my friends said, the one that it, uh, survived with me said, do you remember these ghosts that you would come to us at night? I said, they weren't ghosts. There was me and other people scaring you. Did you notice that? They didn't know that it was them? No. How they old were they? Four? They were like four or five. And I was, so four, they really, and I was almost six. So it was like, so it was, was like, uh, what, what, so it was like, what, uh, are they so like 70 years later? I don't know how so I remember it. I just remember the song I sang. So, so like 70 years later, they found out that it was just you? Exactly. 70 years later. Talk about a long time ago. They would sell one puff. Yeah. Or they would sell a bite of an apple. I don't know how they got the apple. Uh, Somebody. Women who had to work outside. Oh, and they would come and they would sell for a piece of bread a bite of apple. Is that worth it? You know, for one puff. Why would they trade bread for an apple? What's the difference? Because you could get a bigger piece of bread for a smaller piece of apple. Yeah, but yeah. Apples more valuable? Apples were, were not uh, allowed here. You should remember that apples were only if some prisoners working outside were able to smuggle apple to the Right. That so was it a was luxury. like a treasure. It was fresh food. Right. What was the treasure here? The most important thing, garlic. Garlic? That yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, especially garlic? for adults. Because it's helping us to survive a little bit during our diseases. Oh, I didn't so know also that. It was treated like medications almost. Now how did the, how did the kids get cigarettes? Uh, mainly from warehouses of Canada. And they, for, they would find some cigarettes and they would make a one pair it, would give it to the children. Hello? The children would sell it to the couples. So they well, the kids want to see I remember standing in front. No, they didn't sell it. We should take it away. It was an underground economy of some kind of children. So they didn't take it away. I don't. I don't. I remember them standing. Who wants that? Not. <laughs> Consider it a warning that if we aren't there to to uh, stamp out evil before it destroys us. I I was saved, and not to go with a group with this fifty thousand people on the death march. The Germans were rounding up everybody because the Allies were coming. They knew the Russians weren't far away. So their philosophy and policy was leave no witnesses. So whoever they could get hold of trying to round us all up and take us to Germany. And um, my mother appeared in, in the uh, children's barrack and I was so shocked to see her. I wasn't even sure she was my mother. She sort of looked familiar but she was swollen, her face was swollen, everything was distorted about her. I have not seen her for a long time, at least six months. So I sort of looked at her and I didn't even know how she walked in. It, usually the doors were locked. It just said it was at the end of the war and everybody was running and, and the Germans were coming in and shooting people and getting them to walk. And I guess somehow our our barrack was unlocked and she comes in 
And this is what she says to me after I, I recognized her. She says to me, you know, uh, they want all of us to go to Germany. We have to walk. It's, it's, it's hundreds of miles. And she said, it's snowing outside. Look at me. I, I'm going to die on, on, on this walk. I'm completely, in fact, she was almost dying of starvation. And she said to me, you know, you, you look as if you could survive, but I don't want you to survive in a world like this. I don't want you to live by yourself if something happens to me. Will you die with me here in Auschwitz? I didn't even have to think about it. I was so happy to see her. I said, yes. She took my hand. And at that time there was chaos. So somehow she she got me out of the barrack and we started to walk together very close to the other barracks so we shouldn't be noticed that much. Because outside people were screaming and running and the dogs were barking and, and they were shooting and we somehow crept along very quietly until she came. She knew about it, of course I didn't to a hospital, women's hospital. We walked in, it was very quiet, except that here and there somebody was crying, I guess from pain, but there was just just the sick people there, just, just the women. She started walking around from bed to bed. She touched different corpses until she found a corpse of a young woman who must have died a few minutes ago because she was still warm. So she told me to, or when she took off my shoes and hid them somewhere, and she told me to climb in, and she began to manipulate my body in such a way where uh, I wouldn't be detected that I was, that somebody was there with a corpse. And she said to me, try not to breathe much uh, so that the blanket doesn't move and she put my mouth towards the floor so that whatever breath would, would be coming out would not be that visible. And she said, nobody will uncover you, but I will. Whatever you, you hear, don't get uncovered. And she disappeared, and I'm lying very, very close to the body. I sort of, I'm trying to blend in with the body. Then I hear, Heraus, heraus, out. They, they sort of um, opened the, the door, rushed in, began shooting, and went from bed to bed to see if there's any, anybody who's pretending to be dead or anybody who, who can walk out. And I heard people trying to walk out. I heard screaming. And it, it was like all of a sudden from this quiet sp uh, place, but I didn't move, not even for a second. And some, I heard some boots stop over, stop by my bed, and I held my breath. I don't know how long I could have done it. And then the, the person moved on to the next bed, being convinced that the, that the corpse he was looking at, that I was with, was really a corpse. And this went on for quite a while. I did not budge, and then I smelled smoke. Uh, they took whoever they could, whoever they could, those who couldn't walk their shot, because the policy was leave no witnesses, and they thought that they only left the corpses there. That's it, and they they must have left because there was silence, and I I, I began to inhale smoke, but I didn't budge. All of a sudden, my mother uncovers me and says. They're gone, just like that. They're gone. And I sit up, and as I look around the room, so many people have also been hiding, women, hiding with corpses. And it looked as if the corpses were sitting up because behind them was a person hiding. And that was how I survived. And by the time we, I put some shoes on and walked out, there were no more German in Auschwitz. They all had gone, but they closed the electrified gates behind them. So we were still inside, 
the, the, the Auschwitz, but we all walked and waited. The Russians came a few days later. It wasn't right away. And that's how I survived the last day. And they came January 27th, 1945. I was exactly six and a half years old. It was, um, it was something new. It was... What do you think about going to all the places that Safter was when she was a child? Um, I learned a lot about history. Okay. Okay. Organized and made the most beautiful trip in every way. I want to thank you. The kids were good most of the time. It was a fabulous trip. In the next few months, I have 10 places to speak. Many of them are in, in um, schools because I'm, it's very important that people uh, know about it and, and become aware and beware of what hatred and prejudice uh, can lead to. So I, I do a lot, a lot of speaking. As anytime anybody asks me to speak, I do. to a look back at the legacy of the Holocaust. Survivors of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp in Poland marked the 75th anniversary of their liberation today. They gathered at the rail depot where Jews from across Europe disembarked from cattle trucks and were murdered in Nazi gas chambers. Poland's president, Andrzej Duda, said the world must never forget. The anniversary comes at a time when anti-Semitic attacks are increasing in the United States and in Europe. News Hour special correspondent Malcolm Brabin has our report from southern Poland. When the Soviet army liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau, they were greeted by about 200 starving, freezing girls and boys. Somehow, they had avoided the fate of a quarter of a million children originally transported here. On the far left, a feisty five-and-a-half-year-old Polish-Jewish girl kept alive by a combination of good fortune, her mother's ingenuity, and her own iron will. Now approaching her 82nd birthday, Tova Friedman of Highland Park, New Jersey, was compelled to return for this historic anniversary. We are here to uncover evil. That's what we're here for, to show evil and what it can do if unchecked. Tova has spent her life campaigning to keep the memories of the Holocaust alive. You knew you were going to die, but you didn't understand it really as a child, but you knew people were disappearing. And every time I think about it, I think of the children who aren't here. And I remember when they were taken. Although Tova has returned here several times before, this monument to mankind's bestiality still has the power to overwhelm. When you see that, oh, the barbed wire. It scares me to death, even now. I remember that so well. I remember that people try to reach it to, kill, to get killed. It was easier to die than to stay there. On the electric fence? Yeah, but you weren't allowed to because they wanted you to die in their terms, not your term. So there was a guard with dogs, and by the time you came a little closer, you were shot. So people, all these dead people were lying here because they never reached, they didn't reach the electric wires. For untold thousands, this was their last view of the world, the only preserved gas chamber and crematorium in Auschwitz. It lacked the capacity to deal with the Nazis' objective of erasing Jews from the face of the earth. Today, their factory-sized slaughterhouses and ovens in nearby Birkenau are piles of rubble. Before they fled the Soviet advance, the SS tried to erase their fingerprints by immolating the scene of the crime. Tova was once sent to the gas chamber, but she returned unscathed because it wasn't operating on that day. You gotta say prayers. You can't do anything else but pray, you know? Hoping that there is a God and it'll stop it, hoping there's humanity somewhere. It's just 
this was, I think this is too much for me. You know. This is real. The lessons that Auschwitz offers the world today are exactly the same as they were when the camp was liberated 75 years ago. Auschwitz speaks to the dangers of religious and ethnic hatred, of the rule of the mob, of dictatorship, of totalitarianism, and also of turning a blind eye. Most pilgrims to this time capsule emerge thoroughly chastened, but the American whose fundraising helped to preserve the extermination camps so the world would never forget, is deeply concerned by a global resurgence of anti-Semitism. Ambassador Ronald Lauder is president of the World Jewish Congress. Remember, anti-Semitism in the 1920s and 30s started very small and built up. We see it building over the last six years, amazingly, and it's going to keep building unless we do something about it. 1930s Jewish dance music serenaded Top Friedman at her hotel in Krakow. Her story is not just about death and murder. Liberation meant rebirth, a second chance at life. It's my birthday, January 27th. Absolutely. I, I celebrate it. Above all, Tova honors her mother, Reisel, who saved her life by hiding her next to a corpse in Birkenau as the Nazis eliminated witnesses before fleeing the Soviet advance. At last, the little girl was able to cry for the first time in years. Well, first of all, they're going to make me cry now. Because crying was a crime. If they heard you cry, you, you die. You shoot you, right? So I learned not to cry. In the twilight of their lives, the survivor's legacy couldn't be any clearer. But how much of the modern world is listening? For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Malcolm Brabant in Auschwitz-Birkenau. It upsets me terribly when I meet young people, older people, um, who have never heard of Auschwitz. They may have heard of the Holocaust vaguely, and it's very scary because, as somebody said, not to know or not to remember, you may repeat it. We really have to educate everybody. I think everybody in the whole world so we can be wary of what hatred can do, what prejudice and meanness can do. It's, it's very scary when people go about their business and have no idea about that type of how um, inhumanity, what inhumanity can lead to.